speaker every day. It's very nice. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Well, hello, everybody. We're, we're going to kind of uh, get going in a second, but this is our monthly book club, and it is going to be a great conversation tonight. Uh, I know some of you are probably watching this on the recording, and some of y'all are watching live on different platforms. We're keeping an eye on the chats, so you can write comments, nice comments and you can write uh, questions and things and uh, uh, this is a, actually a really special night um, I'll, I'll give a little bit more formal introduction in a minute but uh, our conversation tonight is around Jesus for President a book that I had the honor and privilege of teaming up with my buddy Chris Ha, who uh, is joining tonight hey, hey man from the attic he's been renovating which is also where Katie and I stay when we visit Cassie and Chris and the kids. Uh, but we wrote this uh, in 2000. What was it, Chris? 2008. 2008. And there's so much energy still around it that it's, you know, it's had lots of different uh, iterations. We've got a DVD. Remember these DVDs? <laughs> and uh, there's an audio book. Uh, which has music all through it from the Salters because uh, we, we, you know, it's, it's a very, it's about imagination. So there's all these different renditions, but then this is the newly re released uh, version of it. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, but um, not, this is not just about a book. Chris and I have been closest friends for a long time. Uh, we're, we are really, really great buddies and um, live a few hours apart now. He's at the University of Scranton doing all kinds of cool stuff. We'll talk a little But I surprised him with our other good buddy. Uh, and th this first few minutes will be very confusing because we got Chris Hall with an H-A-W and Chris Hall. But Doc Hall was our professor in undergrad at Eastern University, also became a very dear friend and mentor. Uh, Doc Hall married my wife, Katie, and I. Um, he, he did our wedding and um, has been just an incredible friend to us, but also just became Catholic, which made me think, Doc, that Chris's other book, From Willow Creek to Sacred Heart, is about his journey, you know, into the Catholic Church. Uh, and and said to you, so I'm outnumbered. Uh, you're, 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 we got some serious Catholic stuff happening tonight. <laughs> but you, you, you say a little bit. You were heading up Renovari. Now you're in retirement. You've written a great new book uh, that comes out next year that I'm reading a little early copy of. Um, so say a little greeting to us, Doc. We love you. And then you're going to pray for us and open us up. So, yeah. Well, I'm sitting here really happy. <laughs> I'm very happy. I'm looking at these two guys who, who I, uh, I got to teach way back when, and uh, for both of them, uh, to see how, how the Lord has used them and how uh, they're growing and developing, the leaders they become, makes me smile. Mm. Makes me smile. So it's a very special night for me. Enjoy the book. It's a good one. I remember that book came out. I was somewhat amused by the title. <laughs> So, uh, blessings on your evening. Uh, Lord, bless these folks. Bless Shane. Bless Chris. May your spirit continually rest on them. Deep blessing, Lord, on tonight and on the weeks to come. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night, everybody. Good night. We'll hang out as long as you want to. We'll see you soon. Love you, man. Well, that was fun. That was a little surprised, Chris. And, uh, you know, I think as we get going, um, I thought I would just, there's a little, the the only thing that's really different in the new version is this little intro that we added. So let me get us started as we talk about Jesus for president. Y'all, thanks for joining us. So this is our new intro. It says, a lot's changed since we wrote this book in 2008, but one thing hasn't changed. Christians have a hard time knowing how to engage in politics. As people of faith, we are desperately in need of political imagination. Every time the early Christians declared Jesus is Lord, they were also saying Caesar is not. It was an invitation to a new political imagination centered on the person, teaching, and peculiar politics of Christ. We're tempted to put our hope in a 
party or a candidate who we think will save us from the chaos that we're in. But our hope is not in the donkey of the Democrats or the elephant of the Republicans. As the old hymn goes, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Our hope is in the Lamb of God and the Lamb never fails. Those are the new words in the old book. And uh, Chris, it's good to see you, man. It's good to have a conversation about Jesus for president. You too. It's so good to be with you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as we were talking about tonight, and some folks have probably read the book, maybe others are picking it up. Or like we said, you can get the audio version and you'll have some really great music and stuff. But the part of why we can do this and not and feel really proud and excited about it, but not too narcissistic is because there were so many people that were involved in this, y'all. And if you haven't seen it, um, it's got images and pictures. There's even like a cameo from Chris's wife, Cassie, in here somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> in that, in that, in there, One okay. of those early pictures. But then um, there's art and uh, images that were created um, by our friend Chico. And um, so, so when we started this, people were like, wait, is this like a graphic novel? We're like, no, not really. It's, it's more like a theology with pictures, like animated theology. And uh, everybody, you know, all the publishers are like, I don't know, we've never really done anything like this. But we totally did it and have dozens and dozens of people to thank uh, for helping us craft it, because it is about imagination. And it's about kind of allowing our faith to um, change the way that we think about politics, but also not in a way that we just totally disengage, right, Chris? So that we're just like, uh, this world's not our home. Like we're just passing through. We're going to only focus on the weightier matters of the law, like saving souls and ignore policies and stuff. But we did all the little anarchistic edge when we started, right? And we started these book clubs, right? And, um, and we were trying to figure that out. We were doing little... Uh, uh, like book studies and Bible studies. And this book really kind of bubbled up out of that. Right, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I remember doing these nights where we were studying people like Richard Horsley, who's the scholar of the early new Testament and many other people that were trying to draw out what is Jesus's way of being in the world. And, and what did he try to do um, and especially seeing that in contrast with the mission of many Christians in the United States, which is often somehow to like take power back or try to make America Christian again, um, or somehow feel like in order to improve the world, you have to get the reins of power, which is always somehow seen to be the reins of the government. And we were exploring this different way of viewing it that maybe Jesus doesn't look like the most powerful figure. Um, he doesn't have, I don't know, let's say the budgetary codes for Congress um, or the missile codes for the largest military in world history. But there's something about Christianity, which just quite simply says, if you want to improve the world, it, you should do it the way Jesus did it. If, if you want to bless and love, you should do it the way Jesus did. Mm. So I remember us doing those studies, but not just because we wanted to understand it. I think I especially usually refer to us um, feeling a sense of trauma and grief from what we saw happen in the wake of the war in Iraq. Um, for younger listeners, there was just so much tragedy in the wake of 9-11 in our country, so much like heartache and so much grief. And one person, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove, he said, in our grief, it's like we, we pulled off a pin out of a grenade and decided we have to throw it somewhere. And we ended up in Afghanistan, in Iraq. And as the Lancet Medical Journal um said in 2006, just three years after our invasion, they said maybe around 600,000 people had died as a result of our invasion. Mm. That's mm. 200 9 mm. And that pain and grief, knowing that at the same time, many people in Iraq, as you found, Shane, with Christian peacemaker teams, that many people in Iraq look to the United States and see it as a, a nation of Christian extremists. 
the way we might think of like Muslim extremists. Um, and so starting to see the world from that other perspective um, mm. was, was a part of us wanting to write this. And so some sorrow and grief is, is part of what also generated these pages. Mm. I don't know if I ever told you this, but when you know when I was over in Iraq, we we had a translator that we were passing by the um, the uh, uh, the U.S. military, and he said Al Qaeda, and I thought he was telling a, you know trying to do a bad joke or something. I was like, oh, okay, you know, he's like, no, you know, that's you know what Al Qaeda means, and I said, no, he said it means the base, and so literally in Arabic, the way that we would refer to the U.S. military base is Al Qaeda. But mm -hmm. it kind of reminds me of like, it's all a matter of perspective, right? And even when when you were thinking about, um, you know, what our viewpoint is, what where we sit determines what we see, you know, that um, this same person was telling me, we lived through the Iran-Contra scandal. So, you know, your country was arming multiple countries and making money off of it while they were killing each other. And you know that we have some weapons because your country sold them to us. So we're, you know, we're wrestling through all that. Right. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that we did really fairly that if, if you guys, you know, check it out, you'll see that we, we challenge this, um, the idea of kind of American exceptionalism that, that, uh, you know, America has some unique uh, messianic role to play in the world as history unfolds. And, we 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 um and, and we challenge the theology that kind of um underpins that so uh you know george bush at one point we quoted him way back in the day you know when he said that um there is power power in and he's using this old hymn and he says in the values of america you're like whoa wait i mean i think he just switch did a switcheroo on us there <laughs> switch the the wonder working power of the lord with um with America. And, but then we challenged Obama too, when he said the last best hope on earth is America. And, mm -hmm. and so this, I mean, this book's really about hope, right. And it's about what our hope for changing the world is. Um, and, you know, let's give a little bit, let's paint the picture a little bit. Cause one of the first things that we started with was before there are Kings and presidents, right. So we talk, you know, we've got this image of the kind of lineage that's traced through the Kings. Um, and yet like, it's important, you know, for us to revisit that scripture from Samuel and see that uh, it's this idea that we need a king so that we can be like the other nations was a part of that idea of uh, pursuing power and nationhood um, and something that continues to have residue to this day. I mean, it, it, we really raise the question of whether or not Israel was really supposed to have a king, because God literally says they're they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me as their king. So give them their king. And Hosea says, you know, when we cry out to all the things that kings have done for us, God looks down and said, this is exactly what I told you the kings would do, right? <laughs> so so there's that kind of challenge of power. But I don't know what what do you think of as you as you kind of read that first section? You know, that's one of the ideas that we're. Yeah, you know we've we've come a long way from the Hebrew story and the the holy nation that's set apart from the other nations, but this is all about kind of what God intended, and you know where where we find ourselves now is a little different from the Egyptian Empire, the Roman Empire, but a lot of the principalities and powers are the same, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for those listening, just as an overview of some of where we're going, you know, to reference this first part. We're talking about our first of four parts. Um, and I'll just kind of briefly mention these four parts that we'll walk through here. This first one is the Old Testament. And um, I'll say a little bit of how that chapter has sat with me. Um, but the second one will then be on Jesus. And then the third one will be on like church history. And then the fourth one is on like vibrant contemporary examples of people living out Jesus's politics. And you know, it's been now 14 years since we wrote the, this chapter, and I was pleased today to read it on the Old Testament and um, to think about, it seems one of the themes that we were really emphasizing is that the Old Testament really faces us with the problem that civilization and humanity have gotten itself into a, a hole of, of cycles of violence, of corruption. 
of oppression. And the question, it seems, that starts from this tiny little old couple, Abraham and Sarah, is what will be an alternative to the ways of the world? Will there be anything in the world that uniquely brings us in a different way? And to me, you know, when I would sign um, people's books, uh, Jesus for President books during our tour, I would often sign it, um, may you carry the blessing of Abraham and Sarah. Um, because that theme, I think, really is the starting point for a lot of our book, which is the that couple is called out of the world. Um, these are people that represent a foundation in the whole biblical trajectory that it's trying to not just be like the other nations, not to just be like the other governments, but just with a new different version of God on top of their government, but instead to really rethink and radically rethink what even politics is. And if I were to say um, in the 14 years since we wrote this, um, what starts coming into my mind about what I would like to talk about or maybe write differently. Um, I've done a lot of studying since then because I went and got my You're master's. Doc now. Doc. And, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm a doc now. I got a master's and a PhD since then, which has just been mind blowing. And um, one thing I would want to draw out is that um, what we even mean by a king is such a weird development in human history. Like I've started to study human history from a large scale evolutionary perspective, like even from pre-humans, like Homo habilis and Erectus and Homo neanderthalensis and all these other pre-human species. And one of the things we know is that humans for tens of thousands, really hundreds of thousands of years, lived without kings. And in fact, um, many primatologists suggest that we sort of dangerously killed our way out of having kings or alpha males, you would call them, or dominance figures. And for a long time, we were hunter-gatherers who were ruggedly egalitarian. We wouldn't let anybody exalt themselves, or lest if they did, we would humble them. So there's this interesting thread of human history that Jesus seems to be getting in touch with, which when he says, woe to those, or um, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I think Jesus was tapping into mm. our deeper nature by saying there is something wrong with the entire idea of kings. Um, in, in, indeed, the whole idea of kings, certain anthropologists suggest, was an outgrowth of human sacrifice. Like people would hold human sacrifices with a sentence, uh, like they would consecrate them and then wait for the day for them to be sacrificed. But they turned into like celebrities. And because people would like throw their feces at them or ridicule them or see them as these like magical creatures who were going to be sacrificed. And ultimately, what happened is scapegoats or human sacrifices slowly, as their sentences were extended, turned into kings. They are these people who are just really the other side of the coin of scapegoats. So what we see as like the most powerful figure of a king is really just, if we can see it, if you x-ray it, its deepest roots is this sort of scapegoating that we all have. And I think the Bible, in its attack upon kingship, its attack upon our obsession with alpha males, with the big figure man, um, it's trying to draw us out of that world and so say, good. yeah, that one of the ways out is follow this little elderly couple out into the wilderness. Yeah. So you're getting a little Rene Girard 101. That might have even been two or 301, uh, Chris, yeah. tonight. Um, but uh, you'll you'll hear a little Girard in there because Chris is a really great Girard scholar. But you kind of alluded to this, Chris. One of the images that we have is like, you know, God's spin on power. And it says, um, you know, this is the paradox. A stuttering prophet will be the voice of God. A barren old lady will become the mother of a nation. 
a shepherd boy will become their king and a homeless baby will lead them home. And it kind of gets us to this, this idea that, you know, as we continue to suffer from a lack of imagination and, you know, continue to try to pursue power, God's working with us. And so even the idea that, you know, it's an unlikely shepherd boy that becomes king, but then, you know, you, you kind of see how that power and wealth begins to corrupt and, Mm -hmm. um, in the form of violence and adultery and all kinds of other things. But then, you know, the second section is sort of God's most powerful rebuke of that, that, that um, kingship in Jesus. But it's, it's almost like a, if, if you don't, if you don't pay attention, you miss the joke, right. And you end up continuing to have this sort of colonizing triumphal Christianity. And we start it by pointing out like how overt, the language of scripture is, you know, all of the words, gospel, faith, kingdom, throne, Lord, all of those were in the everyday lexicon in Rome, but Jesus is kind of flipping them on their head and coming as a baby refugee with brown skin is, you know, as Philippians says, not exploiting the, you know, the, the power of God, but coming as a servant, he's washing, he's ruling with a towel, we say, not an, not a fist. Um, and he's, you know, every part of his life, especially the entry into Jerusalem and his, his death, his throne, his, his coronation onto the, the cross is all kind of a subversion and parody of that power, right? So you, you want to say more about that? We kind of go through, we land in a few places that we, we won't get in the weeds tonight, but I think mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's kind of the point of the second section is that, that G, if you are going to have a king, this is what a king does. And a king doesn't kill. A king mm-hmm. dies. A king washes feet. A king is, is very different from anything that you thought they were, right? Yeah. I mean, in one sense, you know, when we when you quoted how George Bush tried to tried to bring sort of religious language to support um, American uh, violence and war, I think it might be more accurate for us to reflect on how the gods were always um, in touch with power. Um, the gods were always in cahoots with governments, you might say, that um, it was normal for people to see Caesar as the son of God. Mm. Um, That was common practice. And so states and empires um, feeling tantalized that the gods are on their side is... That seems like the norm in human history um, in terms of uh, more of civilization and the way people have always been sort of playing God and government in the same song, so to speak. But what we get with Jesus is like a total inversion of that by, as we say in one of the last parts of, of that chapter, so weird that the gospel of Mark steals the way that Caesars were coronated Mm. and applies that to somebody being scapegoated, namely Jesus. Like, so this again, sort of echoes what I said before, which is um, the gospels are doing an X-ray on political power saying that, don't you see that underneath all of the pomp and victory and authority is this blind murdering of God's word. Mm. And God's word is this, you might say, as St. John of the Cross does, is God does only one thing. God is simple, just like a light uh, glowing out is simple. So too, God is simple. God's been always speaking silently a word. And that word um, can only be heard in silence. Um, And that silence might look like Christ on the cross, you might say, which is Mm. God's, if you wanted to see what God's thoughts are like or what God's emanation is like, you would look at the humble Christ um, being murdered by those who are made through him. Um, So this is me just meditating on John 1, where it says, 
in the beginning is God's expression or God's word. And all things were made it made through this word. But when he came and dwelt among us, we didn't recognize him and we killed him. This to me suggests that we are so glued to perceiving God through the lens of power that even if God were to show up, we would just murder her. You know, we we would just not be able to see um, God's presence. And indeed, that is what the Gospels tell us, which is the way of God is much smaller. It's like the mustard seed. It's much more tiny, like the a pinch of salt. It's it's almost invisible, like a pinch of yeast. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not popular. It's like taking the narrow gate, not the wide road. Um, it's not um, puffing up. It takes the worst seat. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't grab for equality with God, but let's go of equality with God. Let's let's go down even into the abyss of feeling like a slave and counted among the transgressors. Um, if you want to see what God's ways are like, look at Christ going down. Lao Tzu even said something similar. He said, water follows the Tao very well. It goes down. So, um, you know, going downward is the way of the Tao um, or the way of God. Mm. And so in that second chapter of reflecting on what is Jesus's way in the world, you know, he quite simply says, you need to love your enemy. Do not resist the evildoer. Um, And all of this points to us as like, wait, but I thought we're supposed to kill the evildoer. And he says, no, you have to imitate your father in heaven who sends rain and sunshine to water the crops of good and bad people. Um, Be like that, because that's what I'm doing. I don't do anything of my own. I just imitate what my father is doing. And that means that Christianity means just imitating Christ as he imitated the Father. But it seems all of us are often just imitating one another, and we're always imitating others. And that just is this feedback loop of whatever we're accusing or interested in or, I don't know, running for $20 off televisions on Black Friday or whatever the crowd is going for is what we grab at. And Christ said, oh, don't grab upward. There's nothing. God isn't only up. God is also down. So God is down there too. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. Um, So those who seek to save their life will lose it. And I was just really happy in this chapter that we made sure to clarify that when Jesus tells us to love our enemies, he is not at all saying, don't do anything about how the world is really messed up, you know, just Mm -hmm. be passive and just pray that it'll get better. To the contrary, we just like Jesus did, he very sacrificially gave himself all the time to caring for others, caring for the poor, critiquing the powerful, Mm. comforting the afflicted, the uh, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comforted, as they say. Yeah. And, um, to me, these these are just things that have, to me, aged well um, in the last 15 years since writing that. Like, I'm glad we said it. And um, there may be parts of the book that I would change. But to me, um, it's it's obvious to say Jesus, his way is um, it is quite a challenge for us to to follow. I remember uh, one of the book clubs we did with Kristen Dumay, who wrote Jesus and John Wayne, you know, and she's like unpacking the pursuit of power. There's also like other, there's so many good books that we've looked at. There's another one. Um, well, anyway, Kristen's book in it, Chris, she says, um, it's it's not that she basically says it, it's not that people that a lot of evangelicals thought that Donald Trump was the savior. It's just that they wish the savior looked a little bit more like Donald Trump than Jesus. <laughs> Sure. And, and we literally have politicians now that are saying, you know, if Jesus had an AR-15 instead of a cross, it might it might have gone down another way, you know, and you're mm-hmm. like, whoa. But I mean, in, in some ways, this is a really old struggle, right, to want a, a Messiah that would come and open up a can, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, actually, I think we even have a picture of a can in there, don't <laughs> we? But like, like that would actually uh, clean house, you know, Um 
And the disciples wanted that, you know, they wanted to call down uh, fire from heaven, which had been done before, you know, they, they, like Peter uh, picks up a sword, you know, like they're, they're constantly going, no, 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 like you don't die. Like this is a revolution. And so it was really hard uh, for them to get it, but they do begin to get it right. Like Peter begins to, I mean, he ends up dying for his faith. Um, the disciples end up just seeing the power of love, even, even, the love for our enemies that, you know, when you do abandon your possessions, you, you get something more beautiful and powerful. Um, but that contrast, you know, it's, it's, uh, we, we had this quote in there, y'all, just to make it really plain of like how subversive the Jesus movement was and, and how clear the language was of sort of like when we're thinking of Christian nationalism, there was Roman nationalism, right? There was this like imperial cult that worshipped the power. And this is this is off of the wall that was in Asia Minor, I think, in like, like 10 years before Jesus. And it said, the most divine Caesar we should consider equal to the beginning of all things. For when everything was falling into disorder and tending towards disillusion, Caesar restored it once more and gave the world a whole new aura. Caesar, the co common good fortune of all, the beginning of life and vitality, and says all the, the cities unanimously adopt the birthday of the divine Caesar as the new beginning of the year. And it goes on to say he's brought our, our world to the climax of perfection. And it says he is sent to us as savior. And it uses the word, the birthday of the God of Caesar has been for the whole world, the beginning of the good news and literally uses the word gospel, right? So there was this sort of worship of imperial power and this idea that Caesar's the savior of the world, not Jesus. And so when, you know, you look at that, we, we kind of, as we get into that third section around the early Christians, um, uh, well, as we look at it in this, this section with Jesus, you know, they were called enemies of the state. They were called atheists because they had lost faith in Caesar as savior. And literally in the book of Acts, these people are pronouncing a king other than Caesar and they were seen as insurrectionists, right? And so it was about allegiance. It was about a whole different identity of where our hope lies. And uh, so that's, uh, that that as you said, that that's aged. I mean, we got the, we got the Christian nationalism unhinged right now. And, uh, you know, Brian Zahn, I think, was just pointing out that every time you see the flag, the Christian flag has to be below the American flag. That's the, the legal flag code, you know, just reminding us that these two things are battling for our allegiance. Right. And so that's that's kind of what that the, the early Christians felt. A lot of those things that are really familiar to what we feel right now is, you know, am I going to pledge allegiance? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, in the in the time since writing this, um, one of the most provocative um, historical understandings of how the church started to weave its story together in harmony with the Roman Empire's form of peace, namely peace through killing off all the competitors, um, is a book, or it's kind of a book-length treatment from somebody who was trying to critique Nazi theology. I'll put his name in here. His name was Eric Peterson. Um, and he wrote a, a very deep uh, chapter called um, Monotheism as a Political Problem. And so it's, it's in our chat here, if anybody can see it here. Um, and he talked about how, you know, in the early church, um, we know that many of them, when they called Jesus their Lord and Savior, that he, they had their faith in him, that he was their, you know, figure of gospel, that, or if they saw themselves as Christian soldiers, we knew that that meant <laughs> a dark sense of humor. Like, to be a Christian soldier meant you weren't a soldier in the Roman Empire, because they were stealing that language with a very dark sense of humor and saying, what they see as their their main allegiance that they're willing to kill for, we would be prepared to die for, but we won't kill anybody because Christ is our commander in chief, so to speak. But when Eric Peterson, who was trying to combat the way Nazis were thinking, 
in his day, he, he said, I detect around the late 200s and the early 300s that many Christians started to narrate that the work of the Roman Empire was ultimately the work of God, and not just any work of God, but uh, in the way that God can use all sorts of things, like God can use, um, you know, a donkey, God can use your mother, God can use a good book or a sunset. But no, God is using the Roman Empire to like bring Christ's salvation. And so some Christians like Origen, partly because they were being attacked for sounding like atheists and and anti-Roman, they started to say, no, when when the the Roman Empire was growing, it was just preparing the way for Christ. And mm. in fact, all of the ways of Rome were just trying to create the conditions for Jesus to come. And as those theologies developed, Christians started to see more and more that the hand of the government is ultimately the hand of the gospel of Christ, not just doing what governments do, like killing off bad guys and, and doing their dirty work, but that it was like harmonious with Christ. Mm. And that type of harmony between the peace of Rome and the peace of Christ became more and more conflated. And ultimately, it only took a few centuries for for the idea that you're a Christian soldier to turn into a literalism. Mm -hmm. that now you are fighting for the Roman Empire or whatever um, Christian government, that you're fighting literally with the sword in total contradiction to Christ's insistence that you put your sword away and those who live by the sword die by the sword. Or quite yeah. simply, as Christ said, you must love one another as I have loved you. In other words, the way to love in this world is to love the way I did it, not doing it with the sword, but doing it with, you know, a washcloth, so to speak. Yeah. And you, you're kind of uh, tiptoeing into this section that the, the third section uh, is when the empire got baptized. So when we begin to uh, baptize bombs and worldly power and um, the often is is seen as as one of the shifts that happened during Constantine um uh as as the the sort of Christian population begins to become a majority and begins to be more accepted and then begins to do the exact same things that other people had done to them they begin to torture and uh burn down other uh religious spaces and um they become the persecutors rather than the persecuted and they lose, sort of begin to lose our soul, right? And that, that battle has been going for hundreds of years. But one of the things that we talk about, you know, I, we, we don't go into the, this in real detail, Chris, but is I think what happened during the Reformation is that there was a, this is interesting too, you being Catholic now and all, um, but, you know, there's this kind of valid critique of power in the papacy and the abuse of power. Um, uh, but then, Martin Luther and some others sort of transferred that um, divine right to the state. Um, mm -hmm. And and now it was like the state can do no wrong. Right. And mm -hmm. and of course, we've seen states do a lot of wrong. Um, and, and you know, I, I talk about Martin Luther and when it comes to the death penalty, he's often seen as the celebrity endorsement for the death penalty because he said not only is the executioner the hand of the state, but they're the hand of God. Mm -hmm. And so literally, like if you're working for the state, this is, you know, God's work and the Romans 13 stuff. So we get into it a little bit, but we we kind of latch on to this idea of revolutionary subordination, right? Mm -hmm. That we're to be um, respectful of authority, but also um, uh, shrewd. And we kind of use that example of it. So when, when the emperor comes by, the peasant bows and farts. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this kind of, you know, there's this this um, honoring of those in power, but there's also a sense that they can also, you know, they can do a whole lot of damage and we don't give a blank check to our government. And the, and I, you know, I think for for me, I think this is where you're at, too, is that the government, the government doesn't have the right to kill. Mm. Um, 
and it raises a question right of even like of the my best progressive friends like can you support a commander in chief of the biggest military in the world because a lot of this is not partisan right i mean um obama raised the military budget trump raised the military budget biden raised the military budget i mean it just keeps it's going up and we have just unimaginable military power in the world and it looks really different from the power of the cross yeah and that is one of the things we briefly talk about in the book that indeed romans 12 and 13 is a huge part of this because martin luther is among those who took a certain way to read these texts and um you know with martin luther for our listeners he's writing in the 1500s so he's kind of part of the beginning of what we call this modern, you know, last 500 years. And if you read his, his um, writings on the tempor temporal uh, authority, he has what I would consider almost a, a schizophrenia towards what it means to follow Jesus. Um, because he, he says to love your neighbor, um, you have to be willing to kill for them. You have to pick up the sword because the sword that Paul refers to in Romans 13 is a sword that you too can wield and you must yield uh, wield it to defend your neighbors. Um, and so, intriguingly, Martin Luther thought in terms of personal defense, he actually was a total pacifist. He would say, you cannot even defend yourself, which was kind of not a unique position that many Christians would think you need to not fight violently uh, in your own defense. But he said, when it comes to loving your neighbor, that's when you have to pick up the sword and, and kill for them. And so um, you can love your enemy and kill him in Martin Luther's view. Whereas, you know, Jesus for president understands the way to read Romans 12 is a little bit more in terms of the way Paul, we think Paul would have understood it, which is all through Romans 12, he says Jesus sounding things like love uh, your enemy. Um, you must, you know, overcome evil with good. Um, don't take vengeance. Instead, leave vengeance to God's work. And literally in the next few sentences, he says, so for vengeance and wrath, you know, God can work through governments and those powers, but the very things he sees governments as doing are the things he doesn't see the church doing. Mm -hmm. um, sure, you, he, Paul says you just shouldn't be afraid of governments because when you're arrested by them, when you're thrown into jail, you're not losing. You can't lose to them, you know, it, because Christ, even though he lost to the government, he won. <laughs> um, you know, weakness is, the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And so Paul was inviting early Christians to say, don't be afraid of governments. When you are persecuted by these pagan, terrible dictatorships, don't bother trying to like overthrow them or beat them. And even when you're losing, it's, it is not something to fear. Um, they can, they have their purpose in the world. They take out the trash and restrain evildoers, but you don't worry, keep doing the work of the gospel mm -hmm. because that that's how to overcome um, evil and doing it with good. Now, what the government does is it restrains evil and that's not what you're up to. Um, you're the, you're working with Christ, not taking on government reins to control power. That is a total change that, um, or a change of mind from what I was raised in the Protestant Christian Christendom worldview, where Christians mainly want to like control government power so that they can be in charge of the culture, being being um, sort of controlling the flow of world history through government. But I think it's it's the way of Christ to give up on that. Mm -hmm. We, so as we, we get into this last section, the, the, we're kind of getting into that a little bit. It's called the peculiar party and sort of inviting everybody to imagine what it looks like to, um, 
to live out the political imagination of Jesus now, right? I mean, literally, we, we begin it by saying, like, um, we, we have different holidays, you know. Even right now, you know, we're beginning the Christian New Year around the birth of Jesus, not the birth of Caesar. Um, you know, we our common prayer book that you, you are a part of all that, you know, as we created that, we start with December, with Advent, remembering that. So it's kind of like we're, we're a part of a different story. But we also are trying to um, see the kingdom of God, not just as something we hope for when we die, but something we're to usher in and participate in on earth as it is in heaven. And this is where I, I wanted us to, you know, spend a little time as we, we've got, you know, 15 minutes left or something to talk about like what, what that looks like now. And we, we have a whole bunch of different stories in the book of, people who have practiced that i mean even you know as you were talking about romans 13 and romans 12 when it says when your enemy is hungry feed them uh mm -hmm. when we went to iraq we took food and we took medication against the u.s sanctions so it was actually against the law and some of the doctors faced up to 12 years in prison and i'll never forget you know as they went to trial it put the whole system on trial on display mm -hmm. and they said we're very willing to go to jail for what we did we believe that we were right in what we did and that, that's kind of what we mean by revolutionary subordination and ironically i think they got fined like twenty thousand dollars and they paid it in iraqi dinar so like they paid it in a big pile of iraqi dollars that it, uh you know taint to the point that that twenty thousand dollars were was worth seven dollars or something so that in itself i think was you know a part of the commentary but it, it's it's it's, you know, figuring out how to be as shrewd as a serpent, but as innocent as a dove, what it looks like to live in the world. And we, you know, we, we have a section on Amish for Homeland Security, where we talk about, you know, how they have lived a life of love and simplicity and nonviolence. And I mean, you know, it's pretty extreme, the Amish, uh, but they do have something to offer us when we're thinking about what it looks like to live as an imaginative counterculture of faith, right? So you want to say anything more about the, the share, this, any of the ideas no. we throw out there in the end or even some that you've seen since then maybe? Um, I, I am actually so proud that when I look back on this book at this last section on creative examples is, um, you know, it's only one of the four chapters, but it's almost 40% of the book. You know, it's really to me, so important that we devote our time to talking about and imagining with the many groups that go against the grain of society. Um, I actually just got back this weekend from visiting with a group called the Bruderhof, which <clears throat> if any of you haven't heard of them, they are sort of like, a, um, oh, it's hard to explain. I mean, from a distance squinting, they look a little bit Amish, but they they run their own businesses, making medical equipment for people with physical disabilities um, and children's play school equipment. And where they come from is just this wonderful reality, which is they got kicked out of Nazi Germany, which to me, that's really <laughs> what you need to be doing if you're in Nazi Germany. You need to either be getting killed by them or getting kicked out by them. And um and so this this group they were kicked out of Nazi Germany and have created a community that is always trying to think about how can we take Jesus's call more seriously to live you know in the against the grain of our culture so this enormous stack of 3500 of these guys that are um you know they're roundly pacifists but they're also trying to create communities that look a lot like um sort of like St. Benedict type monasteries, but with married people and kids where they are um, hospitable, always trying to care for the poor near them. Um, very moved by communities like that. Um, some of my own recent explorations in action um, have been um, my own work in prison. And um, while I was finishing my PhD, I did a year of teaching at Notre Dame's prison education program. And to me, Jesus was breaking open um, our minds from their enclosed, small myopic worlds when he was saying, 
um, when you went and visited me in prison, you know, whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me. Um, I have found that the, when I've lived in my own secluded world, thinking that I'm better than those bad people over there, I'm living in a delusion. Um, and for me, I have been trying to extend my own University of Scranton to do classes there. And we've been doing it for a year and a half where guys can get a degree there. And to me, it feels like the breaking open of, of the joy of, of God's kingdom, you might say, to connect across these, these fake lines of razor wire and um and chain link fences and bars by coming to connect with other people's humanity and um that for me has been just i go into prison you know once a week i'm teaching there now as well um and there are so many folks that living in seclusion i almost feel like if i'm a doctor as even though my daughter says you're not the useful kind of doctor um, <laughs> If I could write a prescription as a doctor, I think one of my top 10 prescriptions might be to tell people to go into prison because, you know, I think it was uh, one of the prophets who said, um, your light will start to break open um, when you start caring for the poor. You know, if you feel down in yourself, if you feel darkness, if you want to see the light break in, well, get outside of yourself. Um, Anyway, that was just my initial uh, two thoughts of of groups or actions that are um, hopeful. Yeah, and some of those things, like we we uh, they, they it's wild what's happened in the last decade or so since we wrote like we wrote about relational tie, the project that we you know kind of collaborated with a bunch of other folks on to give ten percent of our money into a money a common fund and then you know we've sent kids to college and got people dentures and paid for funerals and all kinds of stuff out of that and now there's groups all over the world that have you know these clusters under common change and you know there's some of the the stories like the Bruderhof we're still in relationship to these folks they still inspire us there's also like it does feel like there's a new era in our country I mean I even think of the election in Georgia uh, tonight and this last election, the it's not it's not a debate around ideas or different like what's the best for uh, folks who are in poverty, but there's like this real wild theology that has been embraced that you know many people are calling white Christian nationalism, and it does feel like. Um, while I, I have always proudly said I'm not partisan, um, it's really hard to find some of the redemptive parts that are out there on the other side sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just interested in how you're engaging the current political crisis in America. If you could yeah. give us that, Dr. Ha, in the last few minutes here. Yeah. Well, um. Eli Wiesel, who survived the Holocaust, he said, if you want to truly be nonpartisan, if you really want to love all sides and truly be neutral, you must paradoxically take sides. Um, and he was, he was talking about how in his own context of Nazism um, and the Holocaust, most people are prone to just go with the crowd or just keep quiet and not make any waves. These are the kind of people that Martin Luther King Jr. called white moderates. They're not savage KKKers, they're not bigots, but they are just moderates. They were, they're what the book of Revelation calls lukewarm um, Laodiceans that they're neither hot nor cold, and God just wants to spit them out. Um, and I do think it it is a wrong temptation to indulge, to think that the way to deal with a so-called divisive environment is just to um, stand back and say, well, there's good, fine people on both sides. We should just 
I don't know, not vote or not be partisan or not bring up divisive conversation. And in fact, I take a lot of my guidance from the way Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. responded to white moderates in his letter from Birmingham jail. He said, what, he said something that helps us understand why Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword or to bring division. Mm. That's really wild to hear out of the mouth of somebody we call the Prince of Peace. But the structures of the world, as I said before, if you x-ray the structures of our world, you'll see that there is a sort of mindless scapegoating that um, just sort of wildly goes in all sorts of directions. And to be able to see that for what it is, and Christian nationalism is one of those wild um, sort of dangerous movements. If we're going to see that, we have to be able to critique that and to see that it's misguided in this desire to control through violence. It's also partially animated by fear. It's partially animated by a sense of resentment or envy. Um, mm -hmm. And But the way to defeat some of those is not going to be through calling out per se, but calling people in like trying to love and show compassion to people and have hard conversations with people that we think are indulging a type of resentment ways of, yeah. of thinking. Ultimately, I think we still need to be, you know, what Jesus for president is suggesting, and I really hope we don't lead any people astray on this. We're not trying to say secede you know, become anarchists or have nothing to do with the systems of the world or don't vote. We're, we're not saying that. Um, we're saying that Jesus needs to influence every aspect of your life. You yeah. vote once every few years, but vote every day with your life. Vote um, every day. That's a good word. Yeah. And, you know, not, not to hide our voice or confine our voice to a national election every two years or four years, but to say there's a whole lot of ways that we influence uh, mm -hmm. what happens. And that's how I've come to think of it, too, Chris, is, is, um, is I, I see voting as, as doing harm reduction. Uh, mm -hmm. damage control <laughs> voting for the person that we think might do the least amount of damage uh, not that i'm looking for a savior but i'm looking for a politician that might do less damage than the other politician and mm -hmm. you know and when it comes to preserving life or advocating for those who are vulnerable those jesus called the least of these right one one of the ways i think of voting is saying i'm going to vote for immigrants i'm going to mm -hmm. vote for refugees i'm going to vote for alternatives to mass incarceration i'm going to vote for an end to the death penalty and and some of these races that you know for governor and other things like they they can make a difference on on some of these issues um uh so vote for the poor vote for the refugees vote for the homeless vote for uh the peacemakers vote against the military i had a whole list of things that i was uh, that were hopes in uh under this current administration chris and uh, i'll have to say my list i'm still looking to check many of them off uh, yeah. <laughs> however i also know what happened after the you know in the last season of america and some of the deepest principalities and powers you know were unleashed and i think you know as we use that word mm -hmm. um as a reminder that the same paul who wrote that we should uh you know respect the authorities said in in ephesians we wrestle not principalities of powers and use the same word authorities mm -hmm. of this dark world mm -hmm. so there's that paradox at the heart of our faith that we should have a discomfort with power. Um, we should have a different imagination with how we think change happens. You know, it comes from the bottom up, not from the top down and all that. So it's uh, it's great, man. You got any closing thoughts as we well, wind up here, man? Well, I think one of the images that is very startling for me in the last year and a half um, especially in light of this Christian um, nationalism that we've seen. Um, there's one figure who um, stood out as the, the chief cheerleader for uh, Donald Trump from the Christian camp. His name was Jerry Falwell Jr. And he was the president of Liberty University. And for over a generation, he has been calling for things like prayer in schools and getting America back to God and so forth. And he's been in many ways politicizing 
his faith because he wants to take back America for God, etc. But when it came to um, his staunch support for Donald Trump's policies, some of which involved radically reducing care for refugees and immigrants, um, intensifying the death penalty, and so many other things, um, yeah. somebody once asked him, how does this square with your own Christian politics? And he put all of his cards on the table and he said this, I don't let the teachings of Jesus influence my political beliefs. Hmm. I think that to me is probably one of the biggest differences or things that 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 Jesus for president is indeed critiquing, which which is trying to say, let Jesus influence your whole life. Let hmm. him command how you live, buy, breathe, walk, greet, hmm. speak. Let him influence you because he's Jesus was being influenced by our Father in heaven, and so allowing him to affect us and and show us how to love this world into God's way of being, to me is ultimately where I want to point people. Hallelujah, and that story did not end well. Uh, Jerry Falwell, bless him. Like uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen that film. God forbid, but uh, whoa not for younger viewers. It is, it's really heart-wrenching. You know, we did one of our first red letter revivals in Lynchburg because we saw that and we really did center Jesus, you know, and we said, that's what really is, is at stake is, is um, our faith, you know, it, it's, um, and, and, and so that, that's, that's a good word, man, as we close. And, um, you know, at the end of the book, we have all these heroes. It says, we, we need new heroes. Uh, and it says we need new songs, we need new liturgy, and we need new eyes. And on that note, um, you can join us for morning prayer on Thursday. Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove, who we gave a shout out or two to tonight, and I uh, lead our morning prayer the first of every month. And I think it's going to be at noon at 12 o'clock Eastern time. Um, on no um, on December 1st um, I think that's Thursday so um, keep an eye out for everything else going on we've got uh, an execution scheduled tomorrow uh, so we'll be teaming up with our um, friends at death penalty action we vigil we have a vigil a virtual and an in-person vigil wherever the execution is um, during every execution and uh, that's happening in in the United States right now so there's all kinds of stuff going on at Red Letter Christians, and lots of stuff going on in the world of Chris Ha. Make sure you check out his um, other book. He's written all kinds of articles and good stuff. You can see some of his stuff at Red Letter Christians, but this is another beautiful book of his, From Willow Creek to Sacred Heart, and it captures much more of his heart. And uh, if you want to, grab a copy of the new version of Jesus for President or share it with a friend at such a time as this. Thanks, buddy. It's been a beautiful night.